Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Puppet Masters and Castle Freaks, the Internet's leading all things Charles Band podcast. I am one of your hosts, Gourmet of the Unusual, Jared Hornbeck, and I am coming to you, of course, from Brooklyn, New York. But never fear, listeners, I am not uh, wandering around this uh, Romanian castle basement lair by myself. No, who is here with me? Well, you're here with Steve Guntley, the costly slut. And this is the podcast about sewage fishing, gorilla masks, and of course, goobers. Uh, that's because this is the podcast all about hideous, another delightfully batshit Kushner lock era uh, confection that we are very excited to talk about, who is also going to be bringing in a very important full moon figure, at least for Jared and I, for the very first time on this show. Um, but before we get to all of that, we are joined by a very special guest we're excited to have on. Who is here with us today, Jared? Uh, we are. We have a really super exciting guest today. Our guest, uh, you may have seen his name in print. His name is Addison Binnick. Uh, he is the creator and co-director of Psycho Ape 1 and Psycho Ape 2, which is a, a new one that just came out. Um, he's also been responsible for over 100 episodes of a riffing review show called Movies to Watch on a Rainy Afternoon. Uh, also, another mystery science theater type show called the Tro Masterpiece Theater where that's, I believe, like a riffing show on trauma movies. Um, and he's also made something that I think is so cool in description um, called Magnum Opus. And the description of this, and we'll let Addison say more about it on mic, is Boyhood Meets Jackass. And those are two properties that I was really hoping at some point would come together and this is a collection of stunts and skits and pranks and from old vhs and it's really awesome but addison thank you so much for joining us man so glad you could find the time we're happy to have you yeah thanks for inviting me it's it's been a challenge to finally you know make time for this but i love full moon i could talk endlessly about you know watching the movies and collecting the tapes and dvds and blu-rays and all my box sets and everything you know, Charles Band is a pretty big inspiration for me. You know, I've been wanting to make cheesy, low-budget horror movies like Charles Band and Lloyd Kaufman for my entire life. And so, you know, over the last 10 years, I've been doing just that, you know? It sounds like you failed, though, because I'm checking uh, here on IMDb, and uh, Psycho Wave 1 and 2 have a combined uh, box office draw of $400 million. So I think uh, you, 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 you undershot. I think you could have done... <laughs> <laughs> Four, I mean, if I made four hundred million dollars, that's probably more than Troma ever netted. That's probably pretty good. That's pretty good. I have yeah. not seen these movies yet. These sound really exciting. You have Psycho Wave Two is about to have its world premiere. Is that right? Like as of this recording? Yeah. Uh, today is July thirty first. I hope I can say that. You know. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so I'm about to head to Pittsburgh in a couple of days. There's a convention that happens out there called Gross Fest. Oh. And um, it's not because it's, you know, disgusting and icky. It's because the guys who run it are brothers, Tim and Tom Gross. Hmm. And, you know, it's a collection of independent filmmakers like myself. We all congregate to show our movies and sell movies to the public. And uh, Psycho It 2 will be having its premiere on Saturday, August 2nd at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And... Um, yeah, it's, it'll be the first time that I'll be seeing the movie publicly with a crowd. It'll be awesome. And then on August 22nd, it's having its theatrical Michigan premiere at the historic Howell Theater out here. And that's actually where the first movie had its theatrical premiere. So we're kind of keeping continuity with that. Yeah. But uh, yeah, literally today I got my test Blu-ray. So I got to sit down and watch the movie on Blu-ray with my main menu and chapter selections. And ah, I can order a hundred more copies and get them all to the Indiegogo backers that made the movie possible. That's got to feel so cool to just sit down. Oh, I'm just going to sit down and watch the final print of my mm -hmm. movie. That's just got to yeah, be yeah. really rad, man. Congratulations. Now we, That's so cool. as you can tell by the fact that the date was given, we record this show quite a ways in advance. Uh, what I will do between uh, the time of this recording and the time of this release also uh, is you will have seen already some of these things promoted on uh, Instagram. So if you keep up with our puppet masters underscore castle freaks Instagram, then you will probably have seen some of these updates and uh, you'll, you'll know that these events were going on, but uh, there's also something uh, we usually give people a chance to plug something at the end, but we'll give you the opportunity now uh, Addison 
Uh, this is dropping in September, and I think we figured out that the timing is pretty good because you've got something going on in late September. What exactly is that? Well, on September 21st, uh, the movie got booked by Severin Films to play at the Skyline Drive-In in, in uh, I believe, Shelbyville, Indiana. It's playing on a bill with a whole bunch of bands and other Severin-owned titles like The Great Alligator. Mm -hmm. And they're flying in one of the actresses from that movie, like straight from you know Rome, to come to Indiana to watch a bunch of crazy exploitation films on the big screen. And Psycho 8 2 will be one of those. So, um, yeah, we're having a big drive-in premiere, but it's also, you know, we're right smack dab in the middle of Jess Franco movies and you know other exploitation films and other independent filmmakers so it's going to be a great night september 21st you know a bunch of different movies so you're you're yeah. being screened alongside jess franco films which means you have your b movie bona fides you are definitely mm -hmm. qualified to be on this show when did you first kind of discover a love of uh, b movies and full moon in particular uh well definitely i mean mid to late 90s when i would go to blockbuster blockbuster was actually the only video store that carried full moon titles and i would always wander around and see the front covers to the puppet master movies and you know demonic toys um but uh you know i was always a little intimidated by the front covers because they they are like pretty scary looking, but you know, eventually you like you watch your child's play movies and you watch your nightmare on Elm streets and your fire 13th. And so you kind of clear like the, you know, the big name franchises and you start, you know, venturing off and doing the smaller unknown cult stuff. And eventually I make my way to full moon and trauma and all that stuff. And so, you know, just binge watching all the puppet master movies as a kid, I became obsessed with those movies. And I would buy all the Puppet Master action figures that would come out. I could find those at my local like comic book store, you know, because comic book stores were great for finding, you know, cool little weird action figures. And they always had the Puppet Master toys, Blade, Torch, Six Shooter, and Leech Woman. But they also had other Full Moon stuff like Radu toys, you know, from Subspecies. And so I, I just collected all that stuff. I thought it was all so cool and all so awesome. And then eventually I would start buying my own VHS tapes from eBay. You know, I completed my Puppet Master collection, you know, Head of the Family, Hideous, The Killer Eye, all that stuff. It was just so cheesy and so fun, but I loved it. Absolutely. Now, did you choose Hideous to talk about as a subject or did you spin the wheel on this one? Like like some of our some of our guests will just kind of take a random one. But is this one that you wanted to talk about in particular? I think I did pick this one because yeah, it stands out to me as particularly fun. You know what I mean? Like. It's kind of right at the tail end. 99 was kind of when Full Moon started to, they lost funding from Paramount Pictures, you know? So a lot of their movies became independent releases, but mm -hmm. the budgets became incredibly low. And you could kind of tell on screen that, oh man, like this doesn't have the same kind of production value as something like Subspecies did, or, right. you know, it didn't have the same kind of cool stop motion from Puppet Master 2 and 3. But it still has really cool practical effects. The creatures, the puppets all look really cool and gross and icky. And it still retains this sort of classic full moon feel because the whole movie takes place in a castle. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it still feels like classic full moon before they lost their funding from Paramount. Because I don't know if Paramount helped fund this one. No. Been. I didn't think so. Yeah, we yeah. are we're fully into the what we call the Kushner lock era of Full Moon, mm -hmm. which is like 96 to 99 somewhere around there and yes. we've like rapidly come around on this as like one of or at least I have. It was one of my favorite eras of Full Me Moon too. because this is a real like throw everything to the wall and see what sticks mm -hmm. sort of era. This is a uh, unfettered random creativity from Charles Band. He's definitely reached the point where he's like, "All right, I look I made an effort a couple times to be like a legitimate large scale filmmaker. People didn't buy it. They didn't want it. So I'm just going to lean into what full moon is and always was. I'm going to make it as sleazy and as weird and as chock full of ideas as possible. And uh, they really go for it. The Kushner lock movies are not all good. In fact, some of them are pretty terrible, but they mm -hmm. all take some pretty huge swings. And some of them result in things like head of the family or blood dolls or, or, the creeps or you know a lot of a lot of fun movies from the around this time and i think hideous definitely deserves to be mentioned among those 
I, I think a lot of that also has to do with the fact that I, I, you couldn't see Paramount Pictures helping fund weirdo little creature features like this. Maybe the Puppet Master movies, yes, because they had, you know, commercial appeal because Child's Play, Chucky, all that stuff was popular. Yeah. But no, something like Hideous where it's like finding loopy fetus creatures like in a sewer and then they, you know, kill people and stuff. That's definitely, I don't think Paramount would have wanted to help fund something like that. Well, no. according to Charles Band in the Video Zone, he talks about, because they, they make a point to say in the Video Zone, and so this is 1997 that this one came out. And they make a point to say that Charles Band hadn't directed since Prehysteria. And Prehysteria was th four years earlier, you know, uh, 93. At some point in 93, Prehysteria came out. And I think that with the parent, like, you're totally right. Like, there's not a lot of tiny terror stuff as much during the Paramount era because Paramount were less interested. And Charles Band himself had... Um, more of a hands-off approach to the actual filmmaking like mm. he was more um you know he was uh a, he was like the a producer he was, the he was a producer he was working in the office he was doing this but the opportunity then in the kushner lock to go use the romanian uh location and and direct his own tiny terror movie again was really quite appealing to him so he talks a lot about how he was excited to direct this movie because it had but been a couple a of years of and he's also yeah. really good too because he directed those you know yeah. like head of the family hideous those are charles band directed movies those are not movies that he hired like david dakota to make or you know other sort of like he has a whole roster of people that he would sort of go to in the 90s and hire them to then direct these movies but he has a certain distinctive style that he really you know he'll he'll lean into the grossness and the you know the gratuitous you know nudity and gore and weird stuff that maybe other filmmakers didn't care so much about you know? but he also likes a really verbose script around this around the same time this is where he's really starting to <laughs> oh, indulge yeah. he kind of likes every movie to turn into a locked room murder mystery with all the kind of like flourishes and the sort of dinner theater acting and everything like that. And it like, it's always really fun. It, it definitely feels like he, he turns some phrases the same way a kid is writing an essay in high school to reach a word count. You know, he's yeah. kind of just running out the runtime, but it's still fun to see I, how I like think some of that probably has to just do with the fact they had like one or two locations. So mm -hmm. it's like, all right, let's set a whole, you know, 80 minute movie here. So yeah. fill in the gaps. We'll have some monster scenes, but also we need, kill time with some dialogue like make it interesting though we have Dinner one theater uh castle castle we guys do you guys feel good about a castle <laughs> yeah. yeah well you know go to romania and uh, have you know you know wine and pasta for dinner and then we'll just hang out at this castle during the day shoot a few hours and then go party at night the, the adam sandler model i love it yeah it seemed yeah. though like everybody was on board because if you listen uh to uh, michael uh citroni citroniti who plays dr lorca uh, in the video zone also, he mentioned dinner theater and he said that was the vibe they were bringing to it. He said everyone's goal making this movie was, yes, this was like a locked door, like murder mystery type thing. Everyone was on the same page. They said, let's go big. Let's play. Let's play this a certain way. And they were basically having competitions to see who could chew the most scenery. Mm -hmm. In, in the movie and and i like that it's and the uh, winner is us i i do want to take a second though because addison you referenced mm -hmm. the creature designs in in this movie and i do want to talk you know we spend a lot of time we talked about wayne toth and norman cabrera with doing the subspecies effects we've talked obviously we talk about uh mark showstrom recently we talk a ton a ton about uh david allen yeah. but we haven't really talked about mark rapaport whose special effects are these particular puppets in these in this movie and i i really like the like design of these little goopy guys i, I yeah. just i did and everyone I was like good oh i'm a little surprised that full moon didn't um create little toys out of these guys because at the time, you know, like Toy Soldiers, I think, either was coming out or, or not Toy Soldiers, uh, Small Soldiers. Mm. Um, you know, th that these kinds of like little toys based on little creatures or toys in the existing movies, you know, it was ripe for that. 
And um, maybe Hideous just didn't do as well on video as they wanted to or something. I don't know. But I always like the designs of these things. Like the little porcupine creature, the big bloopy glob that just looks like a disgusting, like, you know, I mean, it literally is hideous. And yeah. it's like my favorite one, you know? I, I agree with all of this. My big problem, probably my biggest problem with this movie in general, is that the best look that we get at these little creatures is the cover art for the movie. Like, yes. you, you don't really get to see these guys in action very clearly throughout the film, which is a big bummer. It's obviously, like, a budget thing, but, like, I love the designs. I'm with you, but, like, they we don't really get to see them do much. Everything happens in kind of super close-up or in the dark. We've we've talked now about a couple of people, and I realize uh, I don't think we have gone down our list of stats for this movie yet, Steve. So why don't we uh, fire those off for our listeners? Absolutely. All right. So Hideous, a.k.a. Deformed Freaks in Certain Markets, was released August 26, 1997. It was directed by Charles Band, written by Neil Marshall Stevens, a.k.a. Benjamin Carr. And it stars Michael Citroniti, Mel Johnson Jr., Jacqueline Lavelle, Tracy May, Rhonda Griffin, and Jerry O'Donnell. So we have somehow made it through 75 episodes of this show without talking about Jacqueline Lavelle. Um, now we have made a couple of uh, random comments here and there. I, I think as much as we try to be uh, a gentlemanly on this show, I think we both have been a little horny on Maine for Jackie Lavelle. But <laughs> you have to understand, Jacqueline Lavelle is a multi-time Miss Nude Universe. She looks so good without her clothes on that people feel compelled to give her awards. So you can't <laughs> really blame us uh, if we're we're being a little thirsty for her because she's a really fun presence in some of these movies. Now, uh, she was a former Playboy and Penthouse model. She modeled under the name Sarah St. James. And like I said, she won several of the coveted Miss Nude Universe titles. Um, and so she was always a little game to show a little skin. And, uh, you know, she became a favorite of early 90s soft erotica films. Uh, but she later came to more widespread attention for playing the title character in the pay cable softcore classic Femalian, released by Torchlight Pictures. So it is a film that we are going to talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh, from there, she briefly became a full moon mainstay. She appeared most memorably in Head of the Family, which we will discuss in a future episode, as well as The Killer Eye and this movie here, Hideous. Now, Lavelle has since stepped away from this exploitation racket. She's working on more serious projects. She filmed a few indie movies, a few guest spots on TV shows. But she did make a return to Full Moon in a movie that I believe we will have talked about. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the schedule forgets. But she did come back in 2014 for a movie called Trophy Heads with a lot of the Full Moon Scream Queens uh, uh, doing kind of a victory lap role. And she is the narrator in the latest movie in the Femalian saga, which is still going. Um, there are still Femalian movies being made to this day. Um, I think she's just so fun in her limited screen time that she has. I think she's definitely a standout of this movie. Now, obviously, the big scene that we need to talk about in Hideous is the probably easily the most memorable moment of this film. Mm -hmm. That involves Jacqueline Lavelle holding up uh, Mel Johnson Jr. at gunpoint to rob him of a biological deformity. And to make sure that no one believes his story, she is topless, wearing a gorilla mask and short shorts. She is actually outside in the Romanian winter shooting this scene. Charles Van talks about it in his book. He said she never complained, never indicated that she was even cold at any point. Uh, he describes her as an all-time trooper and says she was really fun to work with. Uh, this is a genuinely funny scene, I think, uh, because it, it it does follow that logic of, um, again, I'm going to quote community, but like when they're trying to conceal that there's a secret society, they make sure to have like a, a black man dresses Hitler and an astronaut making a panini like in the room so that nobody will believe him, you know, when they're describing details <laughs> of it. It's kind of got that logic, right? He's like, oh, yeah, I was robbed. I was robbed. Well, who robbed you? Well, it was a beautiful topless woman with a, a gorilla mask on. And she talked to like Michael Keaton and Batman. And it was it really happened. She stole my deformed baby that I paid many millions of dollars for. The voice that she's doing with the gorilla mask on is it's getting dangerous, dangerously close to that first baby oopsie voice. Oh yeah, it is a little, oh, yeah. a little baby Utsi. You're absolutely right. It's that it's, would be it's, funny as a as a reference. It's getting there. Um, but Addison, it's funny because you know you picked hideous, and I can't help but think subconsciously you were like, this movie yeah. has a gorilla mask. 
And they get you know, maybe at a very young age when I saw the movie at the tender age of like you know eight or nine years old, I knew mm. maybe you know boobs and gorilla masks were were to be my future. Yeah, you knew somewhere, sometime down the line, those two things were gonna were mm-hmm. gonna come back together in a in a destined. beautiful marriage. It was yes. destined to be. But I mean, Jacqueline Lavelle is so much. She's really fun. She's so funny in Head of the Family. Also, I mean, we've we've kind of that's an episode that uh, we've talked about that episode so much on Mike that people who I know who listen to the show have thought we covered it already. Like I was having a conversation with someone saying how like, uh, yeah, a lot of the bigger titles went, but we've held off on head of the family and because yeah, we I mean, run really, out of them. And they're like, you did. Yeah. It's kind of a crown jewel. I think of that particular era, you know, like she's great in that movie. She's a lead, you know, like in yeah. this, she's, a, she's a supporting cast member, but she does have this particular scene and a lot of funny dialogue in the movie. And, uh, but I think, Charles Band probably saw her in this and was like, okay, let's give her an even bigger role. Right. And I don't use this phrase very often, but I will say that I think Jacqueline Lavelle holding like a Louisville slugger baseball bat with her open leather vest and hot pants on might be my spirit animal. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I mean, it, I, I, again, I don't mean to harp on this element of it, but I do think like, her comfortability with nudity and with her body is kind of her acting superpower because she's very, very confident. It throws off every other character, but it doesn't throw her off at all. And uh, she really uses that to her advantage. Like I, I will get to head of the family, but half of head of the family's dialogue is long monologues delivered while having sex. Yeah. Like it, it's <laughs> one thing to just, you know, run around and do topless scenes, but to be funny in those scenes as well, like, you know, that, that takes a little bit more effort than just like take off your clothes and, you know, to be the gratuitous nudity in the movie, but to have dialogue and be funny and act, you know, that that's why, you know, he kept using her over and over again, because she has an on-screen presence as well as beauty, as well as being willing to do these crazy topless scenes. And it, it always feels like she's in on the joke, you know, oh, it does, it, it does not feel like some actresses you get in these roles and you feel bad for them because they feel like they're being used or in some way, like no, she's, she's not fully aware of what she's bringing to this part. Yeah, it's, it's not exploitation. Like, I mean, it is, but it's also, she's, she knows why this scene is there Yeah, to sell the movie, but well, she's also racing it, you know? Right. And that's why like Mel Johnson Jr. is like, he's like, why are you walking around with no top on? And she's like, I'm free. I'm proud. I'm willing. Yeah. Look. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. It's great. Yeah, no, it's a really funny scene. And uh, so welcome to the Puppet Masters Castle Freaks fold, Jacqueline Lavelle. We're going to talk about you a few more times. And if we've already talked about you in the Trophy Heads episode, I'm going to save the longer uh, description of uh, of your career for this one. We'll, we'll have I'm this. Gonna, I'm going to assume you guys probably haven't done uh, Killer Ivan. Yeah, we have yeah. not yet. Jared is no. dreading that one, I know, because I have not watched it yet, but you've you've seen it. It's well, quite bad, but the, it, it's yeah. fun. I mean, it's pure, pure, like, straight-to-video sleaze. Like, this is the stuff that would probably play on, like, Skinamax and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... I've, I, I've seen, like, a scaled-down version with all of the, like, elongated, you know, sex scenes and stuff like that. I mean, the mm. movie's, like, 45 minutes long. Yeah. You know? Maybe even maybe even less than that because oh, yeah. um, it's pure, pure, just like that's all it is. It was just made because during that era they were just making these skin flicks, you know, like Femalian or the erotic House of Wax, and you know those movies would go like straight to Skinamax and HBO. Was because... Wax spelled W H A C K S? <laughs> no, surprisingly, no. We have to. I think we would have to wait till. Uh, <laughs> Paranormal whack activity. That's that's. I think they. <laughs> there it to. is. That's right. That's who. That's who popularized that one. Yeah, we had to wait a good decade for that one. Uh, we have a couple of other uh, uh, returning favorites from this uh, full moon universe here. Michael Citroniti, who we saw in Demonic Toys too, and he is in Head of the Family as well. Uh, Rhonda Griffin from The Creeps, and of course Mel Johnson Jr., who we actually best know from uh, Total Recall uh, as Benny the Cab Driver who uh, I think is having a lot of fun here. I think he's really campy and uh, uh, really locked into this. I, I mean, I love any movie where there's like 
it's a, where there's a hyper specific niche industry that has high powered rivals. You know, I'm talking about how like 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 uh, uh, Roadhouse has like very specific and powerful uh, bar bouncers, you know, that exist in this whole ecosystem. Or, and, and this one is just dealing with rare human oddity dealers. Yeah, but they're they're operating out of an office niche. You know, not something you hear about every day. Not something you hear about every day, but apparently a very high powered industry. There's got to be like five weirdos who are just like trading these uh, bodies back and forth. But you have a broker who makes a decent living negotiating these deals between like the four or five rich weirdos who care about this. So I always love the implication that there is just this rich ecosystem going on under the surface of something completely bad shit. Yeah, well, I mean, then we, we kind of even see stuff like that now in modern movies where when I mean, you look at something like Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom and there's that whole sequence at the end where it's like, you know, billionaires bidding on dinosaurs and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like, oh, I don't know. Hideous kind of did this first. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know that a lot of people watching uh, or making Fallen Kingdom were watching Hideous as a reference point the sure, entire yes. film. <laughs> They're uh, like, yes, let's make their, this bad. Crossing their arms, going like, we've seen this before. <laughs> yeah, well, this I, is I, another kind of characteristically talky Charles Band film, which is uh, not really to its detriment because I think the people delivering the dialogue are having a lot of fun. You know, who I really liked in this movie was uh, uh, Jerry O'Donnell, not Jerry O'Connell, but Jerry O'Donnell is kind of the uh, the audience surrogate character who gets all of the um, wait a minute, wait a minute, uh, let's back up. Or did you guys see monsters? You know, he gets those kind of lines, you know. But uh, yeah, I think he he's weirdly natural and confident and like comfortable on screen in a way that I thought really worked for this character. Um, I, I enjoyed him a lot for sure. I thought he was a, uh, he, he does a good sort of like uh grizzled put upon guy who is our, like you said, our audience surrogate or avatar for all the weirdness going on around him. But it, it's, yeah, he's got kind of a 1940s PI feel to him a little bit again this is uh there are a lot of acting choices happening in this movie and i i can get behind just about all of them uh and i think it's such a weird mishmash of like different uh, pulling from different genres and things like that but i do i, I think he it, it works as like being played straight as your avatar but it also works as parody sort of like it's a it's a fun performance and like you said mel johnson jr too like his performance works as being captivating he's also kind of channeling his inner tony todd a little bit like a little bit with this and but also for for camp value for going big when he has to go big uh i like everyone in this cast as a matter of fact i i think tracy may's performance is fun like she goes like big and campy and actually there's another there's a word we don't use a ton on the show talking about the performances although it probably applies to some that word is method and apparently Tracy uh Tracy May in the according to the video zone she had her roommate who was uh, a person who designed fragrances create a specific fragrance for this character based on who she thought this character was. And she refused to do any takes of any scenes without having her fragrance on. Interesting. And so she really was trying to channel like, what would this character be like? And I want these people to live in the world of this character that I created. And that's a level of commitment that I appreciate. And also Rhonda Griffin as Elvina in this movie who's playing her ditzy a secretary or receptionist apparently did that movie method in character too, to the point where actors like Michael Citronidi and Jerry O'Donnell didn't know if she was just really stupid or in character. That's fair. And I, I don't know, this is a silly B movie, but there is this odd level of method and commitment to the way they're performing here like the vision like every like sometimes these are the to the detriment sometimes these movies are plagued by like a bunch of people are playing it really 
small and then one person doesn't know what movie they're in. And I don't think you get that here. I think there's a consistency of bigness to performance yeah. that was intentional by everyone. And I, I think it shows like Addison was asking before we started recording, is this one that we hold up in high regard? Okay. If I had to recommend five full moon movies, maybe even 10 full moon movies to somebody, this one might not make the list of ones that come to mind first. But I think this is a really fun movie. I liked yeah. this one quite more than I was anticipating. This being a first time watch for both for me as well as I know for Steve. So yeah. I I had a lot of fun with this one. I did too, and I I uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like we've encountered that several times in some of these movies, where one actor is really going for it, and the fact that nobody else is going for it makes them look worse or makes them look silly for trying. And that's not the case here. Everybody is pretty dialed in on what they're doing. I love that Jacqueline Lavelle kind of emerges as the, if not the hero or the protagonist of this movie, she's kind of the Jack Sparrow, agent of chaos sort of uh, energy here. She is. Yeah, she she's um, she's playing a very specific character. She's kind of a, an Igor to Doctor Lorca, uh, but she's a really weird Igor because she's a a beautiful young woman who seems to kind of uh, be fiercely loyal to her employer at any time and will kind of do anything. And you don't know if it's because she has some agenda or if just because she's crazy or or some nice mixture of both. But it gives her a lot to play with. And uh, she plays it kind of enigmatically in a way that I find really fun. Um, but yeah, so um, I, I think like a lot of, like I said, a lot of Charles Band movies do turn into locked room mysteries. And that is kind of what happens in this movie because all of the uh, deformed human oddities come to life and uh, start stalking and terrorizing everybody. And they're communicating through these really long, confusing text chains, basically like they're passing notes under the door with cryptic spelling that they have to kind of interpret, which I think it's impressive that they can write at all in their state, honestly. Like, okay, we're, we're, we're talking uh, fetuses. We're talking yeah. Yeah, mutant creature fetuses. These are very uh, developed. They are developed. What I like for, for mutant creature fetuses, but uh, it should be noted. Uh, what I like about this, though, is when they get the notes back, it's like when you see on Always Sunny, like Charlie tries to write something. Yeah. They have the intelligence level of Charlie from It's Always Sunny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that stuff is all very fun. But again, my big complaint is just that we don't get to see enough of these cool designs. If you look at the front cover of this movie, these look pretty amazing. Like you got this baby with like four eyes that lives in a jar and you have this porcupine monster and this thing that just looks like a big tumor with a bit of a face. Like yeah. they're, they're really gross and goopy and would be fun to see in action. And we never really get to see any of that. I actually noticed that last night when I was watching it, that a lot of times they're hidden by shadows. Mm -hmm. And I, obviously the reason is because they're puppets, you know what I mean? This isn't, gremlins this isn't critters this isn't even puppet master three this is you know 1997 full moon they didn't have paramount pictures money so they were doing the best they can and um i don't know for for what we do see i i think it's satisfactory yeah um, there's not going to be a wall-to-wall -wall creature fest but what i think we do get is good yeah and that is the saddest part of the Kushner lock era is just that the, the budgets have gone way, way down. Mm -hmm. We can't really afford Dave Allen or John Carl Beekler anymore, you know? So it, it, uh, it, you know, they, you start to see a, a decline in the quality of the tiny terrors. It's Beekler light, but it's still pretty good. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, they're still like, not bad. It's just, you know, the, I, I wanted to see more. I love the design. It's just, I wanted to see them in action a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, they're they're lit to be in the shadows. I feel like maybe that was a little bit of a confidence thing. Like maybe they didn't want the in the budget kind of just wearing on their sleeve. But when you watch the video zone and they show the puppets in like behind the scenes footage that's well lit, they mm -hmm. look really cool. Like there's one uh the puppet that has like two faces. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of the amazing Rob Boutine. Uh, effect from the thing with the two with like the melted face that looks like two faces um and it kind of had that appearance to me uh maybe not as sophisticated but still pretty good looking uh and then yeah i think there's they they talk so much the cast does about 
how much they loved what the Hulk baby, they call it, puppet looked like in person. Mm -hmm. And they kept, they say like, oh, this one looked amazing. It was gross and scary, but it was cute at the same time. And I wanted to just do more scenes with the Hulk baby puppet. And like, yeah, it's obscured a bit by shadow in in the movie. And so there's a, a little bit of a disconnect because it's like they're talking in this featurette about how much they love the puppet designs. But then the movie is showing us these puppet designs kind of underlit and in the shadows and it, it's, it it, it, it's unfortunate voice. you know like that would have been charles bands i think one of his first puppet movies that he actually directed you know what i mean yeah. like he hadn't yet directed a puppet master film and he didn't direct any of the ghoulies films he was the producer you know but he hadn't actually gotten on set and actually directed any of these full-on creature features so it may have just been a creative choice or just the fact that, you know, he may not have, you know, like you said, may have been a confidence issue of how do I shoot these? How do I shoot them well? And, uh, you know, he got better, obviously, later, but this was a first time effort for this kind of movie as director. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a good point, because I feel like... Uh, one of the things with the puppet master movies specifically is that one of the, the, when people think of the puppet master movies and the effects and stuff that they remember, a lot of it is Dave Allen and there's no stop motion in this movie. Right. So that's why well, I'm trying to differentiate in my brain now between stop motion effects and puppet rod puppetry uh, effects in the puppet master movies. And I'm trying to remember like, are they, you know, um, cleverly yeah. lit in places yeah, no, they, no, they no. might be. Yeah, they are. I mean, because if you look at the uh, original like, Puppet Master movies, like the first one was directed by David Schmoller, who, you know, he, he was a good director, directed like Tourist Trap and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then the second one was directed by David Allen straight up. Like he was the director of part two. So that's why that movie is just a wall to wall. The puppets look fantastic. Yeah, still one of the Lee, most impressive uh, uh, stop motion yeah, yeah. shots in, in the entire catalog. Yeah, when Blade leaps off the bed and starts yeah. charging at that girl. And then three, you know, David Dakota directed that one. And then four and five were Jeff Burr. But, mm -hmm. you know, you're looking at all these movies that, yes, this is a catalog of Puppet Master films, but Charles Band hadn't yet directed one. Right. Yeah, it's taken a bit, you know, and I'm glad he finally gets to do a little bit of the tiny terror uh, action that he loves so much. And yeah, I, I, I do always enjoy the films that Charles Band directs. Um, and we've run into uh, quite a number of them at this point. But uh, yeah, I, I, I really do think this is uh, a fun little confection of a movie. I think it, it kind of throws back to the Ghoulies era in a lot of ways, um, especially with the ending, which I think is very similar to kind of what the Ghoulies did of. Uh, yeah, yeah. The uh, oh, we're not really dead, but uh, you know, I mean, I'm the... pretty sure he was just trying to just revamp that kind of thing again because he knew you know those movies made money. They like, did. The, the, the first Ghoulies did phenomenal, you he know, did. phenomenal box office. So he kind of was dipping back into what he knew with like Ghoulies makes money, Puppet Master movies make money. So let's just do more like tiny terror creature feature type stuff, but on a limited budget, and let's go R rated this time and let's make it you know kind of goopier and sleazier and grosser because these movies were going straight to video. Mm -hmm. so he didn't have to worry or a straight to cable too. Um, Cause you didn't have to worry about, you know, censorship or, you know, releasing a PG 13 version for theaters or anything like that. So that's why a lot of these movies, I think they're particularly more fun is because they are edgier and they yeah. definitely feel that way. You know, when you, when you rented something like hideous, or the killer eye or head of the family in the, in the cult horror section, you knew you were renting something a little bit sketchier than your average horror film. There was more weird stuff in this than something like child's play three. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, It wasn't they, bound by the, uh, how do I, how should I say this? Like the, uh, tasteful, um, limitations and aspirations of paramount pictures. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That Paramount was. was devices. Uh, Paramount had definitely been chafing uh, with some of the stuff that Full Moon was releasing. Even though, if you look at that compared to the Kushner Lock era, it is just like terms of endearment. You know, it's just very classy <laughs> stuff by comparison. But they were looking at stuff like uh, I think Shrunken Heads was probably the one that finally 
push them over the edge as far as that uh, that relationship was concerned. I but, mean, you yeah, know, the whole the whole story for that movie is so like messed up, but it's, it's like an unbelievable movie. Yeah, they, it is it's good weird. though. It's like a it's, good movie. It's fascinating. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I like that movie a lot. Yeah, no, it's so um, entertaining. It's so weird. I'm pretty sure did that one get like an actual limited theatrical release? No, but that was the intention. That, that, was that the movie intention. Okay. had a bigger budget than most because it was yeah. theatrically. It was the director. It was Richard Elfman who had directed uh, Forbidden Zone and stuff like that. Right, so right. he had cult cachet. They thought they could cash in on. And then I thought there Charles- was a movie during that era that may have actually gotten like a limited theatrical release. I well, thought that the, was the, the the plan was for it is the plan puppet master mm. four to be called puppet master colon the movie right mm-hmm. and, and be theatrically released and then that actually ran into issues and then instead it just turned into <clears throat> this large you know uh large comparatively for uh schedule for shooting in which they knocked out puppet master four and five uh right after one another uh but that never ended up getting the theatrical release and then i know they also there was talk of there was going to be something called like a puppet wars trilogy mm-hmm. uh that, that was should have been six and instead we got stuck with you know curse of the puppet master which is in my opinion like basically like that was the tail end of the series for me like right. you can watch one through five and you do not have to watch any more of them. And then but according to Charles to- Band in the video zone for this movie, he says Curse of the Puppet Master is the craziest one yet. It's no. the craziest one. We're crazy in terms of, yes, we went and dug through the archives and every shot that you see of the puppets are all recycled from one through five. We did not shoot any new footage of the puppets. Or at least <laughs> any new cutaway. This movie is crazy audacious, if nothing else. Yeah. Yes. I'm crazy <laughs> from, ha- you know, from making it and trying to pass it off as new content. It could have been good. Those, those tri- that trilogy would have been cool. It would have been cool. Puppet War stuff, because, I mean, there's posters, there's, you know, uh, storyboards and stuff. Uh, it looked rad, but uh, what we got was just, like, I don't know, and just, you could tell it was hastily slapped together and uh, shot with, crappy video and everything like it just looks ugly yeah there's a chapter on the puppet wars in nat bremer's book the puppet master complete uh book and really fascinating to read about and i i reading about it in hindsight i'm like ah that stinks like it's too bad that we weren't able to get those but you know they had grand grand ambitions from time to time which no disrespect to Trauma. I, I, you obviously are do a lot of trauma adjacent work, Addison, and mm-hmm. I. You know, there's a ton of trauma movies that are very near and dear to me as well, and I love Lloyd Kaufman and everything he stands for, also. But I feel like that's one of the things that separated Full Moon were these grander ambitions at times, where it was like we've we've talked about their brushes with legitimacy. And when they were like on the verge of like trying to play ball with like an A studio, both studios got close. You know what I mean? Like with Charles Band, you know, this sort of puppet master for the movie, like whatever that concept was to be theatrical released, that would have been big. You know, that would have been huge for them. Oh, yeah. And then with Troma, they also tried to do a live action Toxic Crusaders movie. And they even had, you know, a deal with New Line Cinema. You know, they had just made those live action teenage ninja turtle movies but they kind of discovered that like oh new line is just kind of using us because they you know they were trying to get a better deal out of this they want to actually license somebody else and so if they're saying that like oh we don't need you we have trauma that was just sort of they they were just being used they were they were a pawn in a bigger deal but both Mm -hmm. both companies did get close to uh legitimate mainstream you know theatrical releases sometime in the you know, early to mid nineties. And it's also cool to see now that the things that are coming out that we have Alamo draft house and places like that, where they can get these nice limited theatrical runs for movies going to I'm like, so jealous of that because I live in Michigan and I see, you know, subspecies five and I see 
the the prime evils getting actual theatrical releases at Alamo draft houses. Yeah. Like, Damn, I want to see these. Yeah. I, I buy them and I stream them, whatever, but I want to see a, a full moon movie in a theater just like once in my life. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Fingers crossed that that trend continues that they're able yeah. to, especially with all this like pulp noir stuff that Charles band has going on too. Uh, it seems to be leaning pretty, uh, artistic and now there are a lot of art house theaters and change that's chains that specialize in showing this kind of stuff and there's a lot of different programs curated throughout them where they're picking uh maybe not so obvious choices for movies so i i, I really hope it continues well they seem to be doing far better now than they were you know like 10 years ago because i mean with full moon you get like two to three movies a year now and um they're actually like pretty fun. You know what I mean? Like compared to back in the day when they would do two to three movies a year, those were just movies that they were making to you know keep the lights on. Yeah. They were not, they were not quality films like, you know, uh, Dr. Moreau's house of pain or whatever that was, or like the mid two thousands era when they started like the evil bong movies and the ginger dead man movies. I mean, the, I, I don't think that's a particularly strong era. But um, now, like every year we get, you know, we just got Subspecies 5, The Primevals, you know, we get these uh, these fun little movies with like, I was like, the, the Barbie and Kendra movies are kind of fun. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they just keep, they keep making stuff. They keep, they hire directors like Jim Wynorski and he makes these, you know, Attack of the 50 Foot, you know, Cam Girl films. Right, and, right. I just think they're a lot more fun now than the stuff that they were churning out, you know, 10, 15 years ago when they were just sort of creating content to keep themselves relevant. And now it's not, it's not just that it's, you know, no, no, no. work on the scripts too. make the scripts kind of fun, you know? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been really awesome to talk to you about hideous. Uh, I think this gets a nice uh, recommend from all of us. I think definitely check this one out if you're in the mood for a, a nice throwback era. And if you want uh, to see some great work by Jackie Lavelle, who is uh, genuinely delightful and very funny in this movie. Um, this movie and to me reminded me so much of a couple. I mean, it obviously it just predated the creeps, not by very much by yeah, same a year. couple of months. He talks about in the video zone. He says, we've got mm -hmm. another movie called the creeps coming out. I think this is a good companion piece to the creeps. Yeah. Um, I well, actually I think, think I actually like do. this one more. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I, I do too. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. I mean, there were things like, like this, this, the movie, family, this creeps, all those like that right there, like 96, 97. Yeah. That's a good well, that, run. That is that's a, fun a run. good triple feature. That's indicative of what we've said about the our um, admiration for the Kushner Lock era and what they were doing. We don't have a Phil Fondacaro performance uh, in this no. movie, which always no. sweetens everything a little bit. But I think I just had a lot of fun. I was in a really charitable mood watching it. I guess. Too. Yeah, yeah. I just was in the right mood headspace for it, and the scenes that were broad and silly were making me laugh. And I wasn't. I didn't find myself. Uh, bored too much by exposition i mean obviously when it gets it's a to little this talky, in talky some part, it can know? drag it can drag for sure occasionally but each, never each, egregiously it's too long you know maybe yeah. 70 75 would have been kind of better tighten it up 75 minutes for this movie would have been it's mm -hmm. it's sweet spot but it was also it reminded me um maybe in style also it reminded me a bit of lurking fear mm -hmm. and obviously uh content wise it wasn't really the same story but it is kind of like a bunch of people in search of something find themselves in a singular location the way lurking fear did and so i think that it's uh there was shades of that that i was getting and that's a movie that we watched it really early in the run of our show and both were kind of like eh, it's a lovecraft adaptation it kind of works here but doesn't really work here i have find myself I uh, found myself thinking about it uh, mm -hmm. to where I want to revisit it because I feel like I might appreciate it more uh, a second time through. But yeah, I I was uh, brought back to some other properties. I liked watching this and uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I definitely consider yeah. this one a, a pleasant surprise in the things that we've encountered so far. I, I'm, I I'm too. glad to have been the one to sort of shepherd you mm -hmm. in towards hideous. You know what I mean? 
<laughs> we, sure we definitely appreciate it. Um, and right. thank you so much for being on the show. You, you plugged a couple of your appearances coming up so far, but do you have a, a social media or anything else you can direct people towards if they want to find your stuff? Well, I mean, it's just my name for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you know, nothing fancy, just my name with a variations of underscores and, uh, you know, hyphens and things like that, but perfect. pretty easy to find. And yeah, you'll see all my updates about Psycho It 2, the Blu-ray is out now. And, uh, you know, we are, we have a bunch of screenings coming up and, you know, as of the recording of this, I haven't watched it with an audience yet, but I will be watching it with an audience in three days. So that's got to be such an amazing feeling. And I saw the artwork for Psycho Ape 2 for the Blu-rays. And I have to say that the back of the sleeve of the Blu-ray for Psycho Ape 2 has one of my favorite things I've seen in a recent time, which is the, there's some, you know, photos and things like that in the description, but the heading above the description in bold, <laughs> in bold <laughs> font just says, you do not need to have seen the first one. Not really. I mean, and I'm it's like, just, I can, I, I love that the yeah. idea. Like, ign ignore it. Jump right in. Jump right into Psycho Ape One, uh, Two. You do not need they, to be briefed on what happened in Psycho they, Ape One. They exist. I mean, they're they're. It is a sequel, but they exist as different kind of entities to me. And uh, my partner Greg, who I make these movies with, because the first film is kind of a parody of like slasher movies. Um, we basically swap out Michael Myers for. A, a guy in a crappy gorilla costume, but it's supposed to be a real gorilla. Probably people. better than Halloween's yeah. four through six. Just saying. Yeah. I mean, arguably sure. You know, um, we don't have a thorn cult or anything. We just have, well, you know, good. strings on the back of the costume and sneakers when you see him run around. Well, that's, um, that's exciting. And I'm sure when people get their hands on psycho ape and psycho ape two, they're going to love it. If you love what we do, you can jump onto Apple podcasts or Spotify Drop us a little five-star rating, maybe a review if you'd like, uh, just to help uh, spread the word about the show. If you want to see what we're up to and keep up with us, you can follow us on Instagram at PuppetMasters underscore Castle Freaks. You can also follow me at underscore Jallo underscore Jerry or Steve at Minotaur Matador. Um, we do post our shows, the audio version at least, on YouTube, and we may promote some stuff on threads or blue sky. We just haven't been as active on those platforms as late, but we still do our weekly promos on Twitter as well. So you can follow us there in addition to that, but make sure that you follow Steve's other show that he records. In addition to puppet masters, castle freak, Steve, what show am I talking about? Oh, well, you must be talking about Cinema Arcade. That's cinema and arcade mashed together into one beautiful portmanteau because that is what we are talking about on that show. We are talking about movies that have been turned into video games. We're watching the movie, playing the game, and comparing and contrasting as we go. Uh, our recording schedule is way behind our recording schedule for this show, so I'm not sure where we are with that. But I do know that we recently settled the debate between what is the best version of the Aladdin video game. Is it SNES? Is it Genesis? Is it Game Boy? We don't know. We're going to find out. And uh, <laughs> we should uh, we should be mostly through or almost completely through with a Jumanji miniseries where we're playing all the different uh game versions of the Jumanji movies. So that's going to be kind of fun to revisit. And then, of course, we've got great stuff coming up for October that's going to be relevant to this show. We're going to do a month of horror movies as we did last year, and I cannot wait. we got some good ones coming up. So Amazing. definitely check that out. And be sure to check us out next week because we are coming back with uh, a double header of movies uh, following up to a film that we covered a couple months ago. We are talking about Witch House 2 Blood Coven and Witch House 3 Demon Fire. That's right. We are finishing out the trilogy. And I hope we like these ones more than we did the first one because we're going to be talking about them with the director of the films. That's right. J.R. Bookbinder is going to be on the show talking book about Walter. his two or book Walter. Oh, excuse me. So sorry. I think we did have a bookbinder. We did <laughs> earlier and I'm confusing those. So I apologize. It's book J.R. Bookwalter is going to be joining us to talk about his films. Witch House 2 and 3. Uh, we're very excited to get to those. So tune in for that next week. Yeah, I listeners. Bet, make I sure JR, he's cool. <laughs> oh, awesome. Uh, uh, there we yeah. go. It is yeah. a surprisingly small community. We have a lot of people on the show like, oh, yeah, you're talking to that person. Yeah, I know that. Well, yeah. I, I go to a lot of horror conventions. You know, oh, of course. So I, I sell a lot of copies of Psycho Wave and stuff. So I've bumped into JR. I actually bought his VHS 
of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead at a uh, Dawn of the Dead reunion show like five, six years ago. So I, I have JR's original tape. Oh, that's great. Oh, very cool. Yeah, JR's cool. I, I've met him at conventions too. Super excited to have him on the show. And the listeners, how, you know, we're going to talk about Witch House 2 and Witch House 3 next week. Uh, and you're going to assume we liked them more because we'll be saying that regardless of how we really feel. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're going to keep him on his toes. Yeah. All right, everybody. We will see you next week for Witch House 2 and Witch House 3. Stay tuned. <laughs>